respect you a great deal because you're so interested in the work of the Lord and uh, advancing the cause of the church that you've taken out the time to, to uh, be here and do what you're doing. And some of you are, have paid a good bit of expense. Me, I live here, so I don't have to pay motel bills. And um, so, uh, again, we appreciate you. The uh, course title is Clarifying and Renewing the Prophetic Vision of the Church. Clarifying and Renewing the Prophetic Vision of the Church. And then the overall theme of the whole school is something to that effect. Uh, understanding also a self-understanding of the church and our mission in the world. Um, I, I will be having a few handouts <clears throat> to give you in the course of uh, this week. And uh, if some of you will be here for both weeks. Uh, there'll be several handouts to give you to supplement uh, the, the primary text that you have in your book. I will also be uh, making out, I hadn't done it yet, be happy about this, a test. Um, the good thing about it is we don't grade uh, our students like many people in the world do with A, B, C, D, E, F. The good thing is you really can't flunk this class. Um, so we just want you to get as much out of it as possible. Let me uh, start by saying that um, our tradition of the faith focused any other tradition at that time that I know of, and I'm speaking as a church historian, on the church. Uh, our roots uh, came about because of an understanding of what the church is. I mean by that in contrast to what is salvation, uh, sanctification, spirit baptism. Uh, most of the people in the, in the Christian world was focused on uh, the restoration of salvific principles. Uh, all of them were concerned about how you get saved or what does it mean to be saved? How do you stay saved? If you are saved, is there degrees of uh, spirituality? Is there a second definite work of this called sanctification? Is there a baptism of the spirit beyond sanctification or beyond being saved? Those were the questions that were being asked and addressed by almost everybody from Martin Luther right on up to John Wesley. And that's hard, part of our heritage. But our particular tradition of the faith came about because our forefathers were saying way ahead of everybody else, what is the church? What is its function? And uh, so we now have in 2004 here, starting in 1886, how many years is that? Six hundred fourteen plus twenty three. Hundred thirty seven years. We've been talking about the church for hundred and thirty seven years. And I'm focused on that. Well that's interesting because uh, we see dispensations of restoration of the Christian faith, starting with we start with the morning start of the Reformation. Uh, like uh, John Huss or Jan Hus, uh, as they would say, and um, John Wycliffe. And then you come to Martin Luther with, uh, because we, we start uh, the traditional idea of uh, Luther is that the Protestant Reformation started with him. But the Protestant, the protesting element, Protestant, started with him. But the restoration of the church started 100 years before that 
and people were giving them their lives to say that you're not saved by the, the word or the work of the priest. You're saved by personal relationship with God through faith. And Luther brought about a larger element of it all in um, not only in religion, but in politics and government and all that. That's why he's most notably uh, notable be, uh, for that. Luther, um, he did start, he, he had a very uh, weak concept of regeneration. He didn't have a, um, a uh, in-depth understanding of pneumatology or the, the uh, activity of the Spirit of God in all this. He even taught a, really a forensic justification rather than a regeneration through the Spirit. A forensic justification meaning like he was in a courtroom and the judge just says, you're pardoned. And that's, that was his concept. Uh, and you can't find much uh, doctrine of the spirit all through uh, Martin Luther. But so what did what was a great gift that Martin Luther did? He he started saying that salvation is a vertical relationship between you and God, not a cross in the church. And the Catholic Church made salvation depend on what the Catholic Church said and their ordinances, their sacraments, and all that. In other words, it was across this way. So Luther got us thinking about a vertical relationship with God. But then there was no witness. He, he said, how do you know you're saved then? Well, you really don't know. I mean, that's Luther. And John Calvin was close to saying the same thing, uh, who came a little later than Luther. Um, how do you know you're saved? Well, you really don't know if you're saved or not. Well, why should we live right? Well, just because maybe you are saved. And so there was that struggle there in the beginning. So what was the next real move from Martin Luther? It was there could be an inner witness that tells you you're saved. Martin Luther had a his whole idea is expressed somewhat in a poem uh, for feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else is worth believing. And though my heart long for some sweet token, there's one greater than my heart whose word cannot be broken. That sounds pretty, doesn't it? But it's pretty bad that my heart longs for some sweet token to say I'm saved, but there is none. So my warrant is the word of God. The, the Bible says I'm saved if I do this. So there had to be this next great movement of Christianity was the assurance that you're saved. And it came through more radical Christians like the Moravians, whom Martin, uh, uh, John Wesley uh sprung from them into uh, the next mo great move of sanctification as a second definite work of grace. And um, that experience with Wesley was when he was on a boat, I think coming or going, I think going back to England, and he was on a boat with a bunch of Moravians, and a storm came up, and it looked like they was all going to die. But the Moravians was, he noticed, pretty calm, and assured doing the whole thing because they had a real experience with God. And when a, you have a real experience with God, the deeper it is, the more all fear is cast out. Even death, dying, was not the worst thing for people who had an inner witness in them that they were saved. They knew God. God knew them. And it's the same today. In fact, if you're not willing to die for the gospel, your salvation's called in question anyhow. Remember, the word witness or martyr comes from an original word means, you know, meaning a witness, a testimony. And so if you uh, if you gave your testimony, 
back then and allegiance to Christ and Christ alone, uh, you were putting your life on the line. And so that's why it's translated from martyr. Um, so, uh, but this is what was being dealt with for 300 years from 1517 and actually a hundred years before that with John Hoos and uh, Jan Hoos and people like that. Uh, they were dealing with a personal relationship with God and how, if you know you're saved. And then after that, the dispensations were dealing with, well, is there a deeper and deeper and deeper relationship with God until you come on up to the Pentecostal movement saying uh, that was really a, uh, that grew out of the radical wholeness tradition that believed in second work of grace and sanctification a second definite work of grace that you are immediately instantaneously sanctified. The old man is not gradually, you don't beat the old man up, you crucify him. Uh, and so you are set free. There is a experience with God that set you free. You're now free from sin. John chapter eight, Jesus told that to the Pharisees. If the son make you free, the, the subject is sin. And he said, if the son make you free, you're free indeed. What do you mean free indeed? He's talking to the Jews. What do you need? We're, we're the seed of Abraham. We've always been free. Uh, well, it was just freedom up here in a religious sense. It wasn't freedom in here. But when our forefathers in the church of God you know, you so you got this movement of justification by faith, sanctification. Your head cold? No. Oh. Well, you can remove your your head. <laughs> <laughs> that was cute. Um, usually, in our tradition of faith, if you wore one of them, you were on discipline. You were a dunce. Glad to have our overseer from Nigeria, Nigeria with us. <clears throat> so it was justification by faith, then the assurance of a witness and inner witness. I don't know how Martin Luther missed it and others at that time when this, the Bible says his spirit agrees with our spirit that we're a child of God. And this is how you know you pass from death to life if you love the brethren. So there the passages that teach you that you're justified by faith, that you, you have that full assurance of faith, that you know you're saved. A professor in a philosophy class asked me one time, I went to a secular college, Fairmont State College in West Virginia, which was at the time the seventh best small college teaching college in America. So I counted the privilege to be able to get a bachelor's degree there. But the professor asked me one time, he said, how do you know you're saved? And I haven't been saved that long. I stood up and I said, I know that I'm saved. I know that I know that I know that I know that I know. That I know that I know that I know that I know. <laughs> he said, well, that's not much of a philosophy. <laughs> I said, no, it's a witness. It's a. It's a powerful thing from God, not a philosophy. Um, so anyway, that was what was being dealt with for 300 years till our forefathers came along. Then there, that all this confusion of denominationalism is not of God. And uh, how many believe that? First of all, denominationalism is condemned by the scripture that there be no divisions among you. And so, but we learn to live with it as if there was no way out of it. Uh, people have learned to live with it. Uh, a, a false understanding of the church. And so, everybody says, I'm part of this denomination, I'm part of this denomination. Uh, but I'm, thank God, I'm really part of the real 
What's that mean? What, what is a person like that saying? Well, what they're saying essentially is there is a spiritual church and then there's the real one that you're in. And when they say I'm glad I'm in the true church, it means the one that you're in is a denomination, it's not the true church. Uh, that's what it, that's what it amounts to. And of course, we're teaching that the uh, and our forefathers taught us this. <clears throat> There's no such thing as an invisible church. There's no such thing as a spiritual church. Where when I'm saved, I'm automatically in a spiritual church. And so if you look up in Bible encyclopedias, dic dictionaries, commentaries, it's inevitable almost in every single one of them. <clears throat> it says there's an invisible church and there's a visible church. The, the visible one is the one that you're really in here, but it's always imperfect. It's just made by man. It's a man coalition. But thank God there's an invisible true church. So that's the first thing, if you want to understand about the church, that's the first thing you have to rule out. If you don't rule that out, nothing changes. But the fact is there's no such thing as a a mystical body of Christ. The places I've been, it's it's like they want an invisible church, so there's no accountability. There's yeah. no yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. With the invisible church, there's you know, my, my blessed mother died three years ago on my birthday. She said, she was, mom would say that. She said, you know this invisible church that you don't like? I said, yeah. She said, that's the one I belong to. I said, who's your pastor, mom? Jesus. Where do you pay your tithes? Jesus. <laughs> who's the deacons in the church? We don't have um, them. <laughs> uh, so the, the idea of... Uh, the spiritual church is really a church. But also, the moment you uh, select to believe that, invisible church, invisible church, you've got two churches. So when Jesus said, I'll build well, my church upon this rock, he has to mean one church. But an invisible church, and, a, and now the defenders of this try to say, well, we're really talking about I say, well, really, you're not. An invisible church has a different origin. If you say you believe that, it has a different origin, it has a different nature, it has a different purpose. Where is the invisible church? Well, I'm a, I'm a Presbyterian. Where, where did that start? It started then. Visible church. It, it goes back into eternity. Well, we really don't know, and they don't know either. Uh, which contradicts the Bible. So many passages in the Bible. Anyway, our forefathers got this figured out by, by ruling out the idea of an invisible church. So then, if there's no invisible church, how do you figure out what is the true one? So, uh, is the Baptist the true one? Is the Presbyterian the true one? Is the Lutheran the true one? Is the Episcopalian or the Anglican one, Anglican the true one? How about the Roman Catholic Church? Well, they ruled that out a long time ago. But yet, Protestantism ruled out uh, what Rome was right about. The Roman Catholic being uh, a continuation of uh, the organization of the church, but having lost its spirituality. So when you think of the Roman Catholic Church as a continuation more or less of the organization of the church, 
that began with the apostles. Um, but yet they lost, they committed an apostasy spiritually. And then they started adding uh, praying to saints, uh, all the uh, false ideas about Mary, that the priest alone could commit, uh, forgive sin, things like that. Um, but yet they had more or less uh, the right idea about the church as being a visible institution. And so in, our, in history, uh, the Catholic Church had ruled out completely an invisible church. Since Vatican II, now they're, they're going along with the whole idea that there's a visible and invisible uh, church because they're trying to bring about an ecumenical oneness um, with Protestants so that there will be one great worldwide church. But they, um, they, they taught very emphatically that the church is visible and so that you could have a discipline. Um, any At this point, okay. Um, so here we are. I want to read the, the beginning of this, an introduction and overview uh, to this course. This will be going on for two weeks. And then we have another subject that I really want to uh, hone in on, on um, the reflections on theocratic government, what, what the government of the church is, including uh, the authority of elders, the part they play, the role of the General Assembly, and all that. So uh, if you read this introduction and overview, uh, we don't have time to go through this whole uh, there's two sections of my annual, lengthy sections of my annual address here. Well, we don't have time to word for word go over all that in this course. Um, on page one here, we're, we're just admitting that denominationalism is not the answer. Uh, just denominating, reacting against the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century, reacting against Rome and starting the Protestant Reformation. And almost immediately, um, what cropped up was state churches. So Luther and Germany and the state church uh, of Martin Luther. Uh, and Lutherans taught what and teach today what? that really the church is subject to the state. That's still a Lutheran doctrine. Um, that the, the church is subject to the state. And they don't believe in, uh, especially Luther, believed in, did not believe in, uh, because of carrying on the Catholic tradition, a separation of church and state. So it's, it's called um, the national church the idea of a national church. Um, well, that happened, and, and it was uh, regionally located, mainly in Germany, and then it went to a couple of other countries around Germany. And then Calvin come along, uh, establishing Calvinism, which comes from uh, what came from that was Presbyterianism, Puritanism, in America, uh, somewhat of congregationalism, and then a lot of uh, legacy of Calvin is in the Baptist tradition now. Um, and what does that say? Uh, you still got accepting of denominationalism. Are you the true exclusive body of Christ? No. Um, well, then how is it all this denominated? It's very confusing, isn't it? And yet it's not confusing in the Bible. Uh, the, the 12 apostles did not have 12 independent churches. Uh, and they all considered themselves one body. 
and one, uh, an, one apostolic body there, the apostolate. But then, of course, the, the church would be one also with them. And that's what we see in the New Testament. There's no invisible church in the New Testament. And there's no independent church in the New Testament. So if you say you're, uh, the local church is autonomous and independent, you're ruling out a universal church. Except they'll say, no, the universal church is a spiritual one, that true one, which there's no such thing. Are you following me? Am I throwing too much at you at one time? Okay. I get thinking sometimes I throw too much at myself, so I wouldn't. I, w I would understand if you would. Um, so it, it's just uh, the idea of an invisible spirit, spiritual church or denominationalism just falls down. It's not the answer. So our forefather said there's one more stage of restoration that needs to be considered, and it's the biggest one of all, and that is what is the church? And a lot of Pentecostal scholars I know today and a lot of ecumenical scholars, they're saying the biggest issue, like with Luther, it was justification, Wesley sanctification for 100 years now and 150 years, Pentecostal baptism, uh, they rule for a hundred years each as uh, the, the uh, focus of their purpose. And our forefathers said, well, there's one more dispensation. And that is, what is the church? And that's going to be the biggest question, according to many scholars and thinkers about this, the biggest question of all in, in theology and among Christians everywhere throughout comes back what is the church what is the church is the church if you decide uh, to get 10 of your friends together and let's have a prayer meeting uh, at so-and-so's house is that the church if you get 10 people together and go somewhere and sing and have a prayer meeting is that the church I'm asking you no, it's not. It's it's a group of Christians praying. And uh, is that the kingdom of God? Yes, that's the kingdom of God present there. Uh, but it's not the church. And so the church, that's another thing that goes along with this misunderstanding is to equating the kingdom of God with the church. And most what they're saying about the invisible church, it turns out to be nothing but the kingdom of God. In fact, it's exactly, I'll say that boldly, uh, what they're calling invisible church is exactly the kingdom of God and not the church. We know the church started on Mount Sinai, and it's a creature of the law. Uh, it was a family of God till then, and when they come to Mount Sinai, and God makes a covenant, a mutual covenant, not a salvific covenant a mutual covenant to be the church there. The salvific covenant was made in, with Abraham. And when he split the animal and you'd walk through make a covenant, well, God put Abraham to sleep and he walked through alone. That's a salvation covenant. It's personal it's between you and God. It's a salvific covenant. There, it has no uh, horizontal. It's you and God. And the reason uh, God put Abraham to sleep because it's not a mutual covenant. Jesus died on the cross alone. Jesus provided salvation alone. And uh, but the cup when they come to Mount Sinai, God wants to make the family of Abraham a holy nation. A peculiar people. That's what the covenant is in Exodus 19, verses 5 through 8. Um, it's an important passage. <clears throat> so the church really begins there. Wait, I thought it started with Jesus. Jesus brings that same church. He comes to that church and brings with it the new covenant. But it's the same church 
going, and that's the demarcation line. Exodus 19, 5 to 8. 24, 6 to 8 goes along with it. And it's formed not by baptism, not by faith, not by uh, shaking the preacher's hand. Uh, it's not formed that way. The church is always formed from the beginning here by covenant. The old Baptists, old regular Baptists, some of the old books I got, because that's the tradition that Sperling came out of. Our forefather, R.J. Sperling, came out of the strict Baptist tradition. Uh, one of the leading Baptists of his time said, without a church covenant, there can be no formal church. There can be no church without a church covenant. You, you can't. What is a church? An agreement of saints together. It's an assembly, an authorized assembly, visible, authorized assembly to make decisions. Well, you can't have a visible, authorized assembly unless the people are all in agreement. And the agreement is a covenant. That's what a covenant is, an agreement. And from the very beginning, with Jesus declaring upon this rock, I'll build my church, he said, and if two, any two of you agree on something. So that's the smallest numerical number you get for a church. Uh, I had an argument, uh, a civilized argument, with um, one of the brethren in the staff meeting in our former fellowship. And he said, I'm the church. And I said, no, you're no, you're not the church. You have to have at least two people to be a church. You can walk one and one with God in the kingdom. You can say the kingdom's in me and I'm in the kingdom. But you can't say the church is in me. You're not. I'm getting excited here. <laughs> The church is not in you. You're in the church, if you are. Uh, is, is, Brother Phillips, is it that plain and simple? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's a mutual agreement to live by the law of God and to carry out as a peculiar people the will of God in the world. Fulfill the mission of that peculiar people. And uh, somehow or another... What we're teaching here today is going to catch on. And there's going to be a worldwide movement. I don't know what's going to cause it, how it's going to be triggered by God and as we go forward. But just as sure as we're in this class, it's going to happen. And they shall hear my voice. They're not hearing it now. But they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one shepherd and one fold. There shall be in the dispensation of fullness of time, Ephesians 1 and 10, he shall gather together all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him. <clears throat> Caiaphas, the high priest, who said something that, that was truth and was put in the scripture because it was, but he didn't know what he was saying. That Jesus, it was expedient, it was necessary that Jesus not only to die for that nation only, Israel, but that he might gather together all the children of God scattered abroad. John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52. <clears throat> if you want to look that up. First of all, Jesus 10, 16. Um, this is a 11... Chapter 11, verses 49 through 52. And put in John uh, uh, 17 in Jesus' prayer, verses 20 through 23, which says what? Uh, who's ever got your Bible? Uh, John 20, 17, 20 through 23. Hurry up, Jesus is coming soon. 
23. He's praying now. High priestly prayer. Do what? What you say? Whoever reads it needs to come to the mic. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> Who's got it? Oh, okay, thank you. <clears throat> Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that there may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe in thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Would you go read the first verse over again? Neither pray I for these alone. Okay, I'm not praying for these alone, those there with him at that time. But, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's all believers. As it's carried, thank you. That's all believers as it's carried down. So it's a universal uh, concept in his praying. There he's praying for an ecumenical. Let me introduce you to that word if you're not used to it. Uh, and that's a word that uh, it comes from a Greek word um, that means one house, <clears throat> oikimene, if you, want to, if you want to know the Greek word, oike, oikos in Greek is house. So what, what's this saying? Uh, this is ecumenical. What's this saying? That God wants his people all to be in one house, <clears throat> under one roof. <clears throat> now, the key to this is I have spoken in meetings with them. Uh, I remember years ago speaking, I was one of three Pentecostals that had, they had ever entertained in the National Council of Churches. That was in California about 113 years ago, somewhere like that. I guess actually it was at least 40, 35 years ago at least. And um, they are developing a, and have been since 1900, and especially since 1948, 1910 and 1948, it kicked off the worldwide ecumenical movement. And there are now, last count I had, about 340 denominations that's part of the World Council of Churches and the ecumenical movement. And now the Roman Catholic Church is that movement. They're becoming more or less working together for worldwide unity. Uh, it's a worldwide union but it's not a unity in God. So my uh, testimony to them was we are in the Zion assembly and our former fellowship at one time was an alternative to their ecumenism. There were, it's an alternative. God wants his people to be in one house Amen. under one roof. Um, but how it's going to be done and what it takes to, to, uh, accomplish that they're taking it totally in the hands of man and we're saying it's going to be an ecumenical miracle that takes place every time I said this people would say well brother Phils, that'd take a miracle I said no kidding, no kidding. <laughs> uh, but it's going to happen that has to be part of our message and and right now it's not only part of our message it has to be part of our faith and the way we live it out in Zion assembly So, um, what else do I want to say about that? You know, he really was trying to put us down in that meeting, the three Pentecostals that were there. Vincent Sinan was the other one, and um, 
Harold Hunter, who used to be in our former fellowship. Vincent Simon went on to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. He was the head of and virtually the charismatic leader of the whole Pentecostal movement, charismatic Pentecostal movement before it was over with. Uh, but his dad was the head of the Pentecostal Holiness Church. Anyway, they said, well, uh, Pentecostals are anti-intellectual. And then they said, Pentecostals just write little half-inch books. And it just, I couldn't take it anymore, so I stood up. I said, that's because... inch than you can in a four inch book. <laughs> now I don't know if I was supposed to say that or not. If I should have said that or not. <laughs> but I did. Um, yeah, this is what we're talking about. They're right on this. You know, they even they can see this that God wants us in one house. One visible institution. Because the Bible is so plain on that there should be no divisions among them. And among you means he's talking to believers. There should be no uh, disunity. No Christians, believers should not be divided with the walls of denominationalism. And it gets pretty, uh, God is not the author of confusion. It gets pretty plain that that is nothing but confusion. And it gives, as I mentioned in, as you read the introduction here, uh, it gives sinners and, uh, an excuse to condemn Christianity as a whole. I say it in here somewhere. Um, This state of things, about three paragraphs down on page one, this state of things among Christians is shameful and reproachful, both to God and the people of God. Even the onlooking world has long criticized believers for their quarrels, divisions, and contradictory doctrines, and has cited this condition, that is, these reproaches, as an excuse not to believe the gospel and to remain apart from Christian fellowship and church communion. How many of you run into that? You Christians, uh, don't tell me nothing about what you believe, because this one contradicting you, and you're contradicting this one, and that one's contradicting you. So I, I just wipe the whole thing out. Christianity is a bunch of junk. That gives them excuse to denominationalism is giving them excuse to do. And uh, of course, it is it is foolishness because of the self contradictions in it all. It's 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 confusion and God is not the author. Of it. Who's the author of it then? The devil. The devil's the author of I don't mean every denomination is completely like that of the devil, but I mean the system and the idea is of the devil. And that's the first thing, if you're going to advance toward going into a deep ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, that's the first thing you have to do. Dismiss the idea of an invisible church and then focus on what is the visible church, its purpose, its function, its mission, its ministry then that we go from there to understand that. So, um, when, you go, when you go from here, one house, then what's that house like? What is the government of that house like? We've had a recent um, incident, or I don't know what you call it, in our own fellowship that is totally built on uh, a misunderstanding. And in one sense, I'm glad it happened because 
I can see the need to focus and to explain and to settle people in what God's church is and how it functions and its purpose. Um, <clears throat> what is the um, governmental structure of the church? Well, the Baptists don't mind saying at all that it's a democracy. Um, democracy is it comes from the word demos and kratos people government government by the people for the people what's the other one by the people, for the people, of the people, of the people, for the people. Thank you. That's demos kratos. Um, is, is there legitimacy for that? That's the best view of it. Is there legitimacy for that idea in the scriptures? <clears throat> um, no, there's not. Um, and yet, let me tell you how our own people sometimes are thinking that way when they say um, it all hinges on the general assembly. So we can misunderstand our General Assembly and its function if you think that uh, it, the voice of God is the voice of the people. That's an old uh, idea with Voltaire in France during uh, leading up to the French Revolution. Bloody Voltaire said the voice of the people is the voice of God. Is that true? <laughs> no, I remember when we, for example, to show how people misunderstood. When we started Zion Assembly, we reformed and reorganized. And people were saying, some people were saying, I got my voice back. The former fellowship had ruled me out. I couldn't speak. I got my voice back. Well, that voice back and let me put it another way theocratic government which we'll get into in a moment theocratic government does not mean it comes up this way but it comes down this way and upon this rock I will build my church yeah on um you establish on earth. Whatever you bind and loose. Uh, the, the King James Version, the verbiage there, the tense of the verb, is not quite right. It makes it seem like, in the King James Version, whatever you agree on down here on earth, God will agree on it in heaven. But the verb should be, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. So the church is just carrying on on earth what God's will is in heaven. And how do we know the will of God? Through the spirit of God. When he comes, he'll lead you and guide you in all truth and righteousness. <clears throat> and he shall show you things to come. The coming of the Holy Spirit made it possible for us to perfectly know the Bible and the Spirit of God to know the will of God. So, um, I want to talk about it either now or in the course of this week. And next week, uh, the, the way this functions. But we'll go to that a little bit in a minute. 
Well, then there's a, a, an absolute monarchy. Talk about that in a minute. We talked about um, there's an um, Episcopal system. That was the Anglican idea, and it's also uh, it's it's uh, Anglican, and then over here in America, the Anglican Church called the Episcopalian Church. So Episcopalian, and um, then there's Congregational. That's local church independence and autonomy. Uh, and it's so easy to prove that's wrong. There's no, that's not in the New Testament anywhere. Congregational. Then we talked about the state church system sponsored especially by Erasmus, but uh, and his dealings with Luther, and Luther adopted those ideas. Now, this right here has some truth in it. My, my mic's cutting out. It's of the devil. Thank you. You can tell I'm turned on, but I need this this turned on. Can you hear me? All right. So let's talk about Episcopalianism a little bit or the Episcopal idea, it comes from the word bishop or overseer, and uh, episkopos. Um, this is a, a system that makes everything hinge on bishops or ordained uh, Overseers. It's self perpetuating and it has a sharp dichotomy between laity and clergy, and it naturally leads back to Rome. So it's a Roman Catholic system. Uh, Catholic but it doesn't have to go in all the way back to the form of Roman Catholicism Anglicanism modified that but the Roman Catholic system is uh, the, the common people have no voice no say so and it takes away the dignity of the individual believer after all, Jesus said, you shall receive the Spirit, and he shall guide you and lead you. The word there uh, is plural, guide you all. He will lead and guide you all into all truth and righteousness. So that gives a dignity to anyone who has the Spirit of God within them. And Brother Sullivan, I noticed, hit on this just a little bit about the peculiarity of gifts. Being able to labor in the word and doctrine is a gift from God, an appointment for just certain people whom God has called to do that. So does that mean uh, then that the laity is nothing? No, because 
each, each one has the Holy Spirit within him and are being led and guided by the Holy Spirit. But not individually, not individualism, but uh, being led by uh, ordained, God-called, let me put it that way, God-called, God-anointed, God-ordained men who uh, exemplify that those gifts. So now you go to the assembly, and if you don't understand the assembly right, you think that everything's equal. Well, it's not equal, not in role. Everybody's equal in spirit and as individuals before God, but we're not equal in roles. Men and women are not equal in roles uh, in the ministry. And none of us are equal in roles. So when you go to Acts 15, and they're having, we will study about that some. In Acts 15, there's only about four or five names mentioned there uh, of those, whoever all the assembly was. Uh, the multitude kept silent, so there's a multitude there. But it is being totally governed and led by Peter and Paul and Barnabas and James. And then later on, they send Judas and Silas out to uh, send the decrees that they agreed on there out to all the churches. So were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. But I think it's significant of all that is said about elders uh, everywhere else in the New Testament, even there in that assembly is totally governed and controlled and uh, guided by the apostles and elders. And when they write letters, making the decision, it says, from the apostles and elders. And the apostles and elders came together to consider this. In Acts 15, the apostles and elders came together to consider the, the issue at that time, which was circumcision uh, of the Gentiles. That, that leads me, to, I'll get back on that. That leads me to another point that I want to emphasize heavily so we understand what the church is. Um, Acts 15, they get it straightened out doctrinally that the Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. But then they adopt a compromise. They take it upon themselves as the church to compromise with the Jews saying, let them go on circumcising. And then it said that we only do these necessary things right now to get us by this conflict that we're having. Because the church was about to fall apart. It was about to divide there. And uh, so the apostles took it upon themselves that they had the authority by God to make a decision like that. And, well, you, you say everything has to be plainly shown in the Bible. I want to really get to that one. Sola, sola Biblia. You know, Luther said sola fides. Uh, faith alone, which is not true. Now they come with their doctrine, the Bible alone. Well, it's, it's really a moot point. So where do you go from that? This guy over here has got a Bible, said, I'm going by the Bible alone. And this guy said, I am. I'm going by the Bible alone. No, I'm going by the Bible alone. No, you're going by the Bible alone. <laughs> and they're teaching four different things. So what is missing in all that formula? What is missing that chaos? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit yes. Government. Government. The church. What is the role of the church? The role of the church is to interpret Scripture. And to not only interpret Scripture, but to 
work out in a practical way the life of the church and the ministry of the church in harmony with the scriptures. And uh, I ran into a good scripture the other day, although it's everywhere in the New Testament, but it, it kind of clarifies what we're talking about. Nehemiah, somebody get it? That's in the Old Testament. Nehemiah chapter 10, verses 29 through 39. Now, there's been several restorations of the church in history. You okay? Though, there have been several restorations of church in history, and of course, the Babylonian captivity was a major one, and they're coming back out to restore the church. This is happening here in Ezra and Nehemiah. Both of those books are intriguing. You should study them carefully, especially in regard to the subject we're talking about. How do you restore the church? So let's look at this covenant, and of course, back to the covenant. You can't have a restoration of church without a covenant. You can't have a church without a covenant. <clears throat> uh, uh, a concrete agreement about who you are, what you are, what you're doing, what's your ministry, what's your mission. There has to be agreement on all that. So um, somebody read this passage, uh, if you have it, at the mic. Somebody read this passage, if you will, at the mic. Okay. Our official reader. Now that's 10, 29, 10, uh -huh. 39? Yes. Okay. I'm going to interrupt you, you know, like the old preachers. Okay. Read! Read. <laughs> and then you, you, it's drive you crazy trying to keep up with them. Okay. But I'm in the driver's seat here, so it's okay. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nathanians, and all they that uh, had separated themselves from the people of the lands and to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters. Okay, so hold on just a second. There is a separation from the world, even the religious world, to the law of God. So this, this covenant... It's saying uh, we're making a new covenant with God, a fresh covenant. It's based on the same thing at Exodus 19 on Mount Sinai. But they're reviving and restoring that, that original commitment. And, and it's, uh, it's a radical thing going on here, separating from the whole world and everything in it, including all its pagan religions and misunderstandings and uh, separated unto God and his law. Okay. Everyone having knowledge and having understanding, they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God, God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God. Oh, okay. So there it is. Back to uh, the church with Moses on Mount Sinai, the restoration of that. That's what this is. And now a new a restoration and a new commitment, fresh commitment to the word of God. Uh, there's several of these in, in the Old Testament to show this. And OK, go ahead. And his judgments and his statutes. And that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land and take their daughters for our sons. And this is a radical commitment to the original purpose of marriage. A radical commitment of God's church to the original person, purpose of marriage. Okay. And if the people of the land bring ware or any victuals on the Sabbath day to <clears throat> sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, and that we would leave the se uh, seventh year and exact exaction of every debt also we made ordinances for us oh, well this is a, a big one 
Also, we made ordinances for us. We made ordinances. We're separating ourselves into the law of God, but also we made ordinances for us. That is, the church is empowered by God and authorized by God to make practical decisions to make living out the law right. Y'all hear me? Y'all hear this? The church has the authority to make all kinds of laws or commandments, not contrary to the law of God, but to help us to know how to keep the law of God and to practice it. And that's what they're doing here. Uh, and what are some of the things they say? We're made an ordinance for us. Didn't come from God directly. Uh, it's what Paul says one place. I don't have this as a commandment from God, but I'm giving you, I have the Holy Ghost, I'm an apostle, I'm giving you this on marriage. And we accept it as the Word of God now. Because once that happened and it's included in Scripture, it becomes uh, equal to the Word of God. But we have the, not only the, the authorization and the liberty to do, do, to do this, but the responsibility. So, away with Scripture alone idea. Uh, you know, like say somebody says, uh, show me that word, show me that technicality in the Scripture. We're not arguing about that. Uh, we don't have to. Okay, so we made ordinances for us to what? To charge ourselves yearly with the third part of a shekel. Yeah, well, this. excuse me. You know, I, I'm, I'm really going to baptize you with this horrible, horrible thing. Um, read that verse right again. Um, we also made ordinances for us to charge ourselves. Oh, yeah, to charge ourselves. Charge ourselves to do certain things so that we can carry out and fulfill the will of God, like tithing. Go ahead. Yearly with the third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. Yeah, there's no commandment on that. God didn't show everything on that on Mount Sinai. He doesn't show it explicitly anywhere in Scripture. He wants the church to reason it out and for us to charge ourselves to do these things, to be faithful to ultimately to God and His law. It's important, Brother Davis, to grasp that. Okay, go ahead. For the showbread and for the continual meat offering and for the continual burnt offering of the Sabbaths, of the new moons, for the set feasts, and for the holy things and for the sin offerings to make an atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. Thank you. 39. Go ahead to, thir skip yeah. to 39. <clears throat> For the children of Israel and the children of Eva Levi shall bring the offering of the corn, of the new wine, and the oil unto the chambers, where are the vessels of the sanctuary, and the priests that minister, and the porters, and the singers, and we will not forsake the house of our God. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, we have, let, let's, uh, I was illustrating this recently because misunderstanding of things like this. There's nowhere in the Bible that you can show foot washing, yes, but the separation of men from women to wash feet. It's nowhere. We made that up. How many believe it's right and, and uh, necessary to keep God's word? Obviously, then, as the presiding bishop, if I hear about a pastor who said, you know, that's not in the Bible. Show me it in the Bible. Well, it's not in there. Separate your men from your women when you go to get ready to wash feet. That's not in there. But decency is, and also stupidity, decency's in there, and you shouldn't do anything to promote 
a sexual imagination in a foot washing service? So the man gets down to wash the woman's feet. How nutty is that? And you're going to, you know, probably wash part of her leg. whoop de do. Where does that go? It's indecent. Everybody knows it's indecent. So if that's happening, uh, you know, I know we've been washing feet and women separate the men together. I don't think, where do we get that from? It's not in the Bible. I think we're just going to bring men, men and women together to wash feet. And that gets to me. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to call or whatever, and I'm going to go down there and stop it. That's my job. And I don't care what the issue is like that. Show me this is in the Bible. Show me that's in the Bible. I can show you the principle of holiness and the principle of righteousness in the Bible. But how am I doing time-wise? I'm out. It's over. We're not over, but it's over. Yeah, we'll take it up tomorrow. <laughs>